All right, we're going to go ahead and get started now. So welcome everyone to this online panel titled, Is OER Right for Your Computing Classroom? We have a great set of panelists and we have a great set of questions and we'll also be opening up to audience questions. Um, but before we dive into that, I just wanna mention that this panel is being hosted by ACM2Y. And if you aren't familiar with ACM2Y, ACM2Y, um, can you go to the next slide, Marcus? ACM2Y is a group for those interested in computing education in two-year programs. So associate degree programs, typically what we call them in the United States, um, they might have other names in other countries around the world. We have over 160 members from 30 different countries in ACM2Y. And the mission is ACM2Y advocates for a diverse group of computing students and educators by building a targeted and resourceful community for faculty of two-year higher education programs. And so the goal is to support faculty in these types of programs so that we can ultimately best support our students. Um, you can check out the website at acm2y.acm.org uh, acm um, and there is a join link there. So if you're not already a member, would encourage you to join ACM2Y. Um, and when you join, you'll get a welcome email and you will be added to the listserv where we can have, we can continue the conversation from this panel, even after this panel, as well as any other topics of interest to this community. All right. Um, and then if you could go back to the other slide. Great. So let's dive in now on this panel. <clears throat> And um, just to let you know how this will go, we'll start with the panelists introducing themselves. I've got some prepared questions. Um, if you and all have questions as we go, feel free to um, type those in the chat. Um, we have Marcus Geisler helping us uh, with moderating the Zoom room and collecting questions. And um, we, can, we can address those when we get towards the end. Uh, and once the prepared questions are complete, we can also, if anyone has a microphone, you can feel free to jump in. We can have more conversation um, after the prepared questions. Um, and so with that, I think we can go ahead and stop sharing the screen so that we can see each other a little bit better. And as I mentioned, I will first of all ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, um, mention you know where you work, what's your role at your school, and we will start with Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeff Elfner. I'm a teacher in Arlington, Virginia, at the Arlington Career Center. We have a so I'm a high school dual enrolled instructor, and we have a, an associate degree in computer science program here. Uh, through Northern Virginia Community College concurrent with our high school program. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Terry. Yes, I'm Terry Lane. I'm a professor at Mount Empire Community College. We are down on the tip of the state, if you don't know where we are. Um, I teach uh, computer science here at the Mountain Empire. This is about my 30th year. And we've been in doing OER um, classes with materials or I don't even know how long now, but it's been quite a bit. <laughs> Thank you. And Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Payne. I'm with Bright Point Community College in Chesterfield, Virginia. I am the OER and instruction librarian for the college. So, um, of course, my focus is on supporting the faculty with um, any of their open education needs. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. And so um, I want to start out with a question directed at Lisa to kind of talk about what is OER. Some of us might might have heard of it, might not really know what it is. Maybe you're actually using or maybe you just have no idea. But so, Lisa, if you could start us off with what is OER? Great. Thank you. Um, and I believe we have a couple of slides. One of them is an infographic, which to me um, helps to understand because sometimes there's a confusion between what is um, free, right, freely available material and what is actually um, an OER. So if we can back up one quick slide, there's um, a great definition. I think we can back up. So um, this is from the Hewlett Foundation, which is one of the um, one of the first to really um, uh, support OER and provide funding and, and help to, to promote it within the um, 
academic institutions. So basically they're teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or released under an intellectual property license. And normally that license is considered, um, there are different kinds, but the predominant one in the United States is the CC, which is the Creative Commons, right? Um, that permits the free use and repurposing by others. And that repurposing, that is really the key. And we can go back to that infographic so that you can see the difference between um, what would be considered a free resource, right? No cost. So that might be like a YouTube video or some really um, interesting um, in interactive that you might find uh, like a, um, I'm trying to think, like a zygote body or something with anatomy, something's already freely available. But um, to be OER, you have to have um, the ability to repurpose it in some way. You don't have to repurpose it in every way. There are five ways you can repurpose. Um, you can remix it, you can revise it, you can reuse it, retain it and redistribute, right? And then of course, there's that no cost component. And that's the, the big piece of the, the difference is um, an OER, an open educational resource is something that you, depending on the licensing and their varying levels of licensing, when I say licensing, I'm talking about the Creative Commons license, licensing. Um, and the person that creates it and goes to share it openly, they're the ones that set that license, right? So they'll say, okay, well, I'm going to share my work and everyone can take it and they can revise it. Or maybe someone else will go, I'm going to share this work and you can use it, um, redistribute it, but it's not for commercial purposes, right? And the majority of them, actually all of them are for non-commercial purposes. But um, so that's the gist. And then you also see fair use and that falls under a copyright piece, right? But when we're talking about OER, we're talking about openly licensed materials that can be um, repurposed in some way. So that's the, the big piece, the difference between something that's free and something that is an open educational resource. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lisa. That, that helps a lot actually. <laughs> um, so now um, for Terry and Jeff, as we think about, you, you use uh, OER in your computing courses. So what courses do you use it in and how do you use it in those courses? We'll start with Terry. Sorry about that, I had to turn on my mic. I use it in three of my courses. I use it in um, a ITE 119. So that's like an introduction to computer literacy, uh, information literacy. And we, in that um, particular class, we teach them how to do Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Google, Windows, we do some snipping tools, and then we have some information literacy labs. So we have to create a lab. So I also use it in a capstone course. For my capstone course, um, I just use like links out there and I make a couple little labs. We do, you know, just the linking and the discussion board for that one. And as far as I use it in an ITE 131 course, which is an introduction to computer course. And we just do some uh, linking and some discussion board and some um, quizzes. I have quizzes out there. Did you want me to show at this time some of the labs that we did, Kara? Uh, sure, yeah. Okay, Marcus, could you bring up on those labs that I sent you? This is a Google sharing lab. And what we did was we just, you know, created the lab and the lab instructions. And we'll put it out there on the course. And then we'll have a video created. So we, you know, walk the students through the video step by step of what they have to do to finish this document and submit it in Canvas. For this particular course, the information literacy course, we've got something like 32 labs. Uh, 
that they have to do in 12 quizzes, and then of course the midterms and the finals. So it's, you know, really intensive of the work that has to be done. So for every lab, um, they do the lab and then we do a video. So the students know exactly what to do. Uh, what other, and that right there is the document that you, we had to create like the starting file. So we do the starting file, the lab instructions, put those out there and then put them out with a video. So the students will know, you know, step by step if they can't follow it through the instructions. And what was that other lab I sent you, Marcus? You could put that up there. Oh, this is our Microsoft Office Word 6 lab where they have to do, uh, know how to do multiple columns. So they'll insert clip art, format the images, make multiple columns, insert a column break, bullets, and format paragraphs. And then with every update of Microsoft Word, we'll have to go in there and fix the, and that's the starting file that we give them. So, and then with every, you know, update of Word, they'll have to go in there and update the lab to make sure that um, all the keys are where they need to be. That's uh, great. Thank that you for sharing that, Terry. I just had a quick follow-up. So those documents were those materials that you had, you know, grabbed from the OER source and then sort of updated with your customizations, such as your school's logo we saw. Is that kind of how that worked? No, we created them at our school to begin with. And Got then um, we've kept them updated throughout the years. Okay. And those are shared then all for everyone in your school? Yes. We have like, um, we used to have a whole lot more, but um, this one particular class on campus will do like a template of that particular class and have the labs all out there. And then we'll update the template and then they'll push that, all those materials out there to how many of our teachers we have. So it sometimes we might have, I don't know. I'm sure at Nova you have like, more than we do. Uh, 20 sections was good for that particular class for us. And we had about 30 students in each section. So the grading was, you know, a lot. But yeah, that's how we handle it. We share that, those labs with every section of the class that we teach at the college. And uh, just to keep everything consistent across the college, what I would do is I would work with our Canvas administrator and we would update our template there at the college and then we'd push it out. Now this Richie Deal, he's one of our professors here at the college. So what we did was we split up the labs and he took and he did the Google labs and then uh, one of the teachers did like the Word labs and another teacher did the Excel labs and another teacher did the PowerPoint labs. And then we pulled them all together into that one template class. And then that template could, uh, you know, we pushed that template out at the first of each semester to have whoever was teaching that particular class. And we use the Who Knew It videos. Um, I don't know if y'all have heard of Who Knew It videos. The Who Knew It videos and Google. No, I'm sorry. Um, Goodwill videos to supplement the materials for the reading and such as that. And we had two OER books that we used with that. And we also did some information literacy labs. They come in from another college to begin with. I'm not quite so sure what college created those to begin with. But when the VCCS started doing the, you know, the big push for the OER materials, uh, we started with this course, the IT 119, which was our like an introduction course. And so we have like six, I think, information literacies. Um, 
labs and somebody else did that. And then, of course, we put quizzes throughout there. So. Great. Thank you, Terry. Um, and then, yeah. Jeff, what courses do you use OER in and how do you use them? So I, I use OER in almost all my courses. Um, but And, and um, it might be good to start with the first time I did that. Um, and, and because it'll it'll help build on Lisa's definition and, and emphasis on remixing, which really had a big effect on my ability to teach at the high school level. Back in 1999, the college board had switched from Pascal to C++ as the uh, language of the AP exam. And I felt that, that uh, C++ was not a good choice as a first language. And, and, and you know, we, it would be fine in the second year course, but not in the first year course. And so I went looking for an alternative. And at the time, the internet was becoming a big thing, or the World Wide Web, rather. And um, I asked around, and, and people kept suggesting this language, Python, that some of you may have heard of. But back then, there was no textbook that used Python. In fact, it was very early on. And so what I, and I didn't feel that I could create all that material myself, but I went online. I had already been active in the free software community for a long time. And I, Alan Downey, a professor, had written a book uh, called How to Think Like a Computer Scientist. And it used Java, but he released it at that time, there wasn't even a Creative Commons, so he released it under the GPL, which is a software license, but he wanted to share it, and so he, he licensed his, his book under the GPL. I found it and loved the book and thought, well, I, I couldn't write my own textbook, but here's a really good textbook in Java. I could convert this into a Python book. So I ended up doing that, and that, that uh, you know, I've, I've now been come friendly with Alan over the years and watched as many, many things have happened to that book. But, um, and I had a, a Python book because I could remix because of the, the, the freedom that, that open educational resources gave me. Great, that, that sounds really neat. <laughs> That's exciting. Um, so next question, um, again, for both Terry and Jeff, uh, do you find that OER lends itself better to certain kinds of courses than others, and especially as we're thinking about different types of computing courses? Uh, Terry? Yes, I think it does. Um, a programming course, I think that would be, um, you know, easier because just because, you know, you can use a compiler, you can give them the lab. They go out there, they do it, and send in the information. Your compilers aren't changing, so you really don't have to worry about your software that much, as you do with, for example, uh, Microsoft Office, where Microsoft Office is continuously changing. If you've written your instructions, say, for, I don't know, 2013 and 2016 comes up, and you've got one little thing that's different, and the students are the ones that you know, suffers, it's like, oh, no, that button's not there, or that's not what my screen looks like, you know, and such as that. And as far as, you know, like my capstone course in my introduction to internet, my little one credit course, those OER materials are, are just fine, that you go out there and get the links and the discussions and, you know, such as that. I don't, you know, I have no problem with open educational resources for that. But the um, Microsoft, where you teach in the Microsoft Office and the Google, where there's so much changing continuously. Oh, yeah, when we do the, you know, like the hardware and the software in that course, where everything's continuously changing, it's just really hard to keep everything updated and going on. But if it's a compiler, you know, you know how often compiler changes, you know, not very often. So you just make one little video and, you know, the other videos, if you make them working through the code, it's, it would work a whole lot easier, I would assume. Jeff? Yeah, so I, I would have to agree with Terry that, I mean, my perspective is more, I teach mostly computer science and 
And, you know, at this point in 2023, we are, it, it's not a lack of materials that's the problem. There is a cornucopia out there. So I, if you do a search, you can find lots and lots and lots of resources. So then you get to have, you have to call through them and, and choose the best ones and, and perhaps borrow and, and, you know, integrate. But um, survey courses that would that would, would be uh, things that change a lot. Uh, that would be a, a, a lot of work to maintain that. Um, I'm working on. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, reviving a C++ book that I found that one of my students worked on 21 years ago, and it's still pretty usable. I got to update it a little bit, but not too much. And so, you know, Terry is absolutely right. The things that don't change make it a lot easier to maintain the resources. And that's true whether it's open or not. I mean, I get, but I mean. The... Great, thank you. And um, Jeff, as you've kind of already hinted at, you um, have not only used OER, but contribute some OER. So um, do you have any advice for someone who might be interested in getting started with actually creating and contributing OER materials? So it, the, the best thing, I mean, most of people who are doing this, are they're like passionate about it or they're interested. It's a hobby. So a lot of materials, when you go and find a material you like, oftentimes the contact person will be there and you can reach out to them and, and say, can I, you know, and, and if you do your remixes, share them back and they'd be excited to, to receive them. And you end up, you find yourself in the middle of a community. Um, it's 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 very exciting. Um, there's so there's so many sites now also that are even trying to aggregate these resources, and um, I've seen so many things happen to how to think like a computer scientist. A, a group in uh, a, a a group made it interactive and turned it into an interactive textbook. So there's a version that is. Um, that you can do entirely through the web, and you don't need to install any software. Uh, which is a which is a big deal because um, in in a lot of schools, a lot of public schools, they 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 don't even have laptops with the ability to run software. So if everything can be done through the web, that makes it more accessible. So um, it's real easy to get started. Just do a search, uh, find stuff you like, figure out who's who's working on it, and reach out to them. Great. Sounds, sounds easy enough. <laughs> um, so yes, we've been looking at talking about what is OER, how do we use it in our courses, um, but you know, why should we even do this? So the next question relates to what are the benefits of using OER for, for both students and instructors? Terry, you want to start us off? Uh, the advantage is, of course, for the uh, students is that uh, they don't have to buy a book. The materials are free. So that was like the driving force I believe for the um, BCCS, the books at one time for this particular class was reaching $200. And that is a lot for, you know, a student going to college on a Pell Grant. So that was one of the, you know, main driving forces for us um, when in a big disadvantage, a big advantage for the uh, student. Um, advantage for us as teachers, <laughs> we're kind of going away with the OER materials on that one particular class. We do have many classes that do incorporate OER at our campus. But for that one particular class, we're going back to the book. Uh, the book cost has come down dramatically. Our books now are like $129 for a semester or like $200 if you're in the computer science program. And it's $200 for like five books. So that was, you know, the big the big consideration for us. Um, you can do like the Cengage and you'll get like the videos and all of that and the platforms. A lot of our schools in our area are given the students Google Chromebooks. So if you have a Google Chromebook, you know, you can't have access. And then at that point, um, 
you have to work around that. So the uh, Cengage with their open platform and you know unlimited books, um, unlimited access is uh, the big advantage to that. While we decided. Thank you. Jeff, what would you like to add to that? So I, um, there's, I think there's two main advantages to open educational resources. The first, of course, is equity. And um, Terry was just talking about that, the fact that students could get a book without having to spend a lot of money. Um, as a public school teacher, we have no, we can't charge students for books. So um, that actually gives us, a, you know, it, 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 it's a big advantage to us because trying to do dual enrolled classes at, where on the main campus, they're charged, they pick whatever book they want and they charge, students have to pay for it. We can't do that. Um, so being able to use open educational resources is, is a big help to us. But there's another really good, uh, another big advantage, which is that it democratizes knowledge creation. So since the very beginning, I've gotten my students involved in creating OER materials. And so I do it and my students do it. I mean, I, I actually have um, a, a site on the University of North Carolina's iBiblio site called the Open Book Project. It, and a lot of the materials there were created by students. Um, HTML tutorials, little, we had a whole series of little tutorials on HTML, CSS, the Unix command line, and they, they were mostly student uh, written. And uh, I, they've been curated and maintained, and I still use them quite frequently as resources. And just to be part of that process is creative and, and exciting. That's really neat that your students actually contribute to the OER community as well. Um, so then kind of the flip side of that, so those are some of the benefits, but what are some of the challenges of using OER? And we'll start with you, Jeff. So the, the, the biggest challenge is a lot of times you're not going to get the full sort of support that a lot of teachers that are, are, are used to. Like, you know, here are all the exercise sets. Here's the answers here. I mean, a lot of the OER materials don't have all that. So, um, you know, you have to, you, you really have to put in a little extra work. I, I think that's really the only big disadvantage that I've, seen is that 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 some of the materials that that teachers are used to are very well like the whole course is sort of laid out for you and that it, that will be a little bit less so with many OER materials. Perry, what do you have to add to that? Um, he's he's hit it head on the creation of the materials for the professors and to keep them updated in the grading because with a lot of these things, you know, the grading is um, built into the platform. So you have to do the grading. And I didn't, yeah, you know, my students, I have them create materials. I never thought about putting them out on OER, but that's a good idea, so. All right, thank you. Um, and Lisa, I wanna bring you back into the conversation. So you've worked with a number of different instructors who wanna use OER. Um, so what are some resources that you recommend for people who want to use OER? There are so many, as was already indicated, that it can often be overwhelming. Um, so one of the first things I would suggest is to um, reach out to your librarians. Um, even if they aren't specializing in OER, they are aware of OER and they can help you find some of these materials. Some of you may have um, librarians on your campuses like myself that do um, have a focus on OER. But um, so that would be a, a good first start. Um, also, and I have um, shared a list of resources that I know will be um, given, a, you will be given a link to, It's um, there's um, a slide. It's also going to be on the website, but uh, there's some really large um, repositories that are good places to start to, just to get an idea of what's out there. Um, one of the big ones is the OER Commons. And within the OER Commons is also, is the ability, you're able to search specifically, um, you can filter by community college, specifically by um, the type of course you're looking for, what type of OER you're looking for, whether you're looking for a quiz or a lab um, or a textbook. 
And of course, there are certain websites, not websites, um, well, yeah, they are websites, like the um, Open Textbook um, or Open Education Network that um, specifically provide open textbooks. And then you can go on and, and take a look and see um, what the OTN, Open Textbook Network, has available. You can even review them, right? Or look to see what other faculty have reviewed to see if it's a textbook that's going to meet your needs. Um, remembering that um, even if you see one and you're like, oh, this is pretty good, but it's not exactly. And then you find another one. Oh, it's pretty good, but not exactly. That's the idea. You can take pieces and parts from multiple textbooks and create your own, which is really cool. Um, another thing to think about is I know in Virginia, we are very fortunate. We have a very strong um, focus statewide on open education. So we have um, the Virtual Library of Virginia that offers all types of um, resources, one being just as we have the National um, Creative Commons, the Open Commons, we have one specifically for Virginia. So if you take a look, most of the states are going to have something specific to your state, which doesn't mean that, um, and for instance, in Virginia and within, uh, I know um, Terry was mentioning the VCCS, we do have some initiatives within our community college system and ways that we work together um, within the um, various community colleges and um, faculty will get together across the college system and create um, an OER text or an OER course. And then that's put into the um, Virginia Open Commons. And then it can also be put into the Creative Commons. And then we use Canvas as an LMS. So often it'll be put into Canvas as well. So um, lots of opportunities. And that's an important piece of um, when you're creating an OER is that item, that book, that um, activity, assignment, whatever, really needs to be available to everyone. That's the point of it. You create it, you make it available. You take someone else's work under the Creative Commons licensing, you remix it, you revise it, whatever you do, and then you make it available again for others to continue to, to um, customize it, right? Just as Jeff was using his students to come in and um, you know, create some of the the book and that type of thing. That's really powerful. That is one of the um, most awesome things about OER is that you can bring in multiple voices, right? You can bring in that diversity, equity as far as um, monetary, but also equity and the opportunity to share lots of different voices and experiences and viewpoints. And also from a faculty perspective, to be able to make sure you are teaching what you want to teach to your students and using materials that will best reach your students, right? Not just some textbook that has been created across the board, right? You really have that opportunity. So that's a wonderful um, thing to be able to use OER for. One piece of the, oh, there it is, the open, um, you can see an OER Commons open author tool, which is really nice. So um, more and more tools are being available to help you create OER, not just find it, right? but to help you create it too. Um, so there are so many things, I would say just kind of take a, a quick dive, look around, start with some of the bigger ones like the OER Commons, um, the Open Textbook Network, just to see what's out there. Reach out to your librarians, um, take a look and see what's happening statewide and your librarians will know what is happening statewide, um, what initiatives are going on. And then um, more than likely, here we go, yes, so um, it says open education has never been easier. Well, yes and no, as Jeff pointed out, um, it's easier and exciting because there are so many um, new opportunities. I mean, I'm on listservs. And so every day, different academic institutions are releasing new textbooks, new courses, that type of thing. But just like when with the internet, right? All of this information, is awesome, but it makes it even more challenging to go through, you know, to vet the resources and to um, decide what um, is going to work for you. So that's why you reach out, you use your each other, you use um, groups like this to say, oh, this is really working well for me. And um, 
and then you know lean on those librarians that's really why i'm here right to plug um, your librarians so i hope that answered your question great yeah thank you lisa and all of those resources that lisa mentioned um, we collected on a page on the acm2 why website that I, I put in the chat so you can check that out and see links to all of those different resources um, and i just want to give um, terry and jeff an opportunity do you have any specific um, computing related resources that you would recommend checking out uh, terry oh the um goodwill videos and um Kind of like the Who Knew It videos that we have, but if you'll go to Goodwill, they have a lot of uh, videos for introduction computer stuff. Thank you. Jeff? I, yeah, I, I don't have any specific ones to recommend right now. I was going to go look them up, but because I, I, I'd have to write them down, but that list that, that, uh, Lisa just showed us that you've compiled is is a great. I recognize several of the, the sites there. Um, there are lots and lots of them. Well, uh, what, one thing I'll I I will add. Um, at, at Lisa was mentioning that we use Canvas pretty much across the state, and I've noticed Canvas is starting to build uh, tools that make it really easy to share materials that you've created into a Commons, and the potential is there. Um, to maybe address some of the things that Terry was mentioning about, you know, and that and, and about having not enough re resources for teachers, because you we could actually, if we did a little bit of effort, coordinate problem sets with answers and and actually have them in Canvas ready to go. So uh, the tools are getting better and better all the time. Yeah, that's a really neat thing. Um, I just threw one more. Uh, computing related resource into the, the chat there, Engage CS EDU. Not sure if anyone's heard of that, but that's a great place to go to look for some resources. And you can also contribute resources there. Um, so I'm not sure if that one's on the list, but we'll add that one if it's not. So just one more there. Um, so that concludes the prepared questions that we had for the panel. And I would like to open it up to anyone in the audience if you have any questions or maybe even something that you would like to share. Uh, maybe a way that you use OER um, that you'd like to, to share with the group. And um, feel free to either type in the chat or um, just jump right in and, uh, and uh, say uh, what you'd like to say. Yeah, Kara, this is Bob Terman out in Virginia. Um, one of the resources that I use um, quite a bit is the Open Courseware project at MIT. And I use it for two different reasons. First of all, it has full featured materials, which is one of the issues that came through about support materials not being there. And so you can easily find a, a course that's presented by topic that has exercises and outlines and videos and lecture notes and that sort of thing that you can then adapt. But the second reason I like the MIT OpenCourseWare project is because it becomes a great place for me to do some professional development because one of the uh, the things that happens in, in at a small school is you're deemed to be the resident expert on whatever topic becomes new. And so this gives me an opportunity to go and study something very often under an expert. And it's all in material form where I can take their course from beginning to end if I want, and then I can adapt their materials. Thanks for sharing that resource, Bob. That's, yeah, that sounds like another good one. Other comments or questions? Anyone else using OER and, and how are you using it? Or want to get started? What, one other thing that was interesting to me was to use TED Talks 
and build a course around that. And I, I have a course that's an introduction to uh, internet services. And I didn't want to talk about the topics. I wanted the experts to talk about them. And so I was able to find TED Talks by uh, a variety of people, T Tim Berners-Lee and the founders of Google and, and, and other folks had um, important things to say in those talks and you package it together and then all of a sudden you have um, a great uh, course, not necessarily in your own words, but in the words of the practitioners and the developers. Yeah, I've, I've definitely used TED Talks in some of my courses, especially uh, my Intro to Information Security course. There's a lot of good TED Talks out there on like privacy issues and security issues. And I've definitely utilized some of those as well. Although I don't think that would technically be OER. Am I correct, Lisa? They'd be free, but not OER. Right, but if you were running a, um, a no cost or a low cost um, course, then uh, yes, that would just natural fit have some of these free materials along with an OER text, you know, like an open text, and then these supplemental videos. So no, they're not technically OER, but you're still, it's free cost, right? Um, so it's just a natural fit. Yeah. Other comments or questions? And Well, just to follow up on that, uh, while it would be pretty difficult to remix a video anyway, Right. I mean, not, I mean, I know I couldn't do that very easily, um, but uh, but if you were to use that as and, and the things that we can remix as educators are uh, narratives to go along with it or exercises that you could adapt and change and things like that. I mean, one of the things that I love about OER, even just like a question set, if it involves somebody's name in the question, I substitute my own students names. And they, you know, just to be able to do that, to be able to take that question, then they're reading when they're taking a test, they see themselves in the test, it's more engaging. So just to be able to do that is a really nice thing. So we could build around those uh, YouTube, uh, I mean, I mean uh, uh, TED Talk videos, I'm sorry, and, and then have OER materials connected with them. That's a neat trick. I haven't thought about putting my own students' names into... <laughs> some of the questions maybe help them identify you know one of the strategies is to get students to identify as computing professionals and that helps with things like retention um, so that's that's neat um, so there's a comment in the chat about um, some of the difficulty of working with interactive oer resources um, does anyone want to respond to that I do, I will say that that is one of the barriers, at least here at Bright Point for our faculty, that because there is not enough of those, and it was already mentioned, I think Terry was talking about it, um, and I think Jeff mentioned too, so not having those bells and whistles, those ancillary materials, that is often a barrier for faculty, um, especially within the sciences, but I will say that more and more is becoming available that are going to be more interactive, but that also would be a case where you could use an OER along with something that's freely available. Um, but that that's that's a problem, that's a barrier because it takes time and it takes money and sometimes the technology that we just don't have in order to match what these publishers are providing, so. That makes sense. Um, other comments or questions? It, to dovetail on what Lisa was just talking about, it, it almost sounds like we need to be starting a conversation about that other side of support materials where that becomes an OER effort that we would be involved in. Developing, uh, you know, here are 25 questions on um, whatever the computing topic is or whatever the the instructional topic is and that that way um over time maybe we could uh, could solve that and then the other thing that i have done is separated uh like jeff had said earlier uh 
separate the timeless stuff from the time centered stuff so that you can take what that which is timeless and put it into data structures that you can then pull forward. And I try to set a criteria for myself in a course, especially if it's an online class, trying to get 80% of the material auto evaluated so that the student gets the advantage of a lot of the new tools, which is the automatic feedback and automatic evaluation, but then gives me time to, to uh, become the automation tool on uh, the other things. And then and maybe we could move forward in that. So that, that might be something for us to think about as a community to uh, how do we go forward so those materials that are absent today could be here five years from now. I will say there is a battle going on with the OER movement and the publishers. And as Terry alluded to, the publishers are dropping prices, which that is helping, um, and, but they are making it really um, affordable, right? And tempting, uh, making it not tempting, but to making it so that it's you really, it's not cost effective to give up those bells and whistles if you're already working with a textbook publisher and have that platform. So, but that is true, Robert, that needs to be the next thing is that we, the, there's gotta be some way to create all of these extra things because that is a huge barrier from faculty fully adopting OER courses. No, I, I would okay. love, to, go ahead. Sorry. I was just gonna say, I would love to see it become part of our regular duty as professional educators to be involved. I mean, we're real, we are really fortunate in Virginia that, that Canvas is pretty much a universal platform. So the potential is there because that tool is, is strong and it, and it makes it real easy to share things. So now we, we, we got to get the librarians involved, Lisa, because if we could coordinate all that activity um, in, a, in an effective way, there'd be, a, there'd be Virginia specific materials made available through Canvas across the state. And actually that's being worked on. So there's the course mapping project there's the Virginia Open Commons. So it's a very, very slow process. The VCCS has been involved. I was Kenyatta that's on this meeting and I were involved in um, a, an open math course. So it's it's very slow, but it is happening. That's neat. I'm, I'm always envious of Virginia. I, I personally teach in cybersecurity. And I know Virginia also has some great resources specifically for cybersecurity, like their cyber range and such. Um, seems like Virginia is pretty well coordinated. <laughs> Other questions or comments from anyone? All right, well, we'll go ahead and wrap up then. I would like to thank our three panelists. Uh, for volunteering their expertise and their time to uh, talk on this panel. I'd also like to thank Marcus for monitoring the chat and the Zoom room, and um, thank all of you audience for showing up um, and contributing your thoughts as well. And I just wanna say um, you can continue this conversation on the ACM2Y listserv. So if you haven't already, please join ACM2Y and I'll see you there. Thanks everyone. Thank you, and thanks ACM2I Thank for doing this.